Welcome to another edition of Inside Boxing Daily. I'm your host tonight, and again, I'm flying solo. This is Jeremiah Pricer. I want to welcome everybody in. Uh, again, it's it's always good, you know. I'm, I'm not talking to any of you folks out there, but it's always nice to you know get the feedback on the podcast. And you know, again, I appreciate everybody who listens to this. And I'm, I'm going to be doing it on my own. You know, Mike is busy. Uh, again, we've. You know, we got credentialed to the the March Madness here, and you know we're just doing things and uh, moving onward and upward. So, again, I'm just going to be relaying tonight's news for you, uh, filtering it, giving you some of my thoughts, and just seeing where this goes. So, let's get started. I'm going to uh, I'm going to begin with the uh, I wouldn't call it tragic, but the unfortunate news that Samuel Peter, uh, the former heavyweight contender. Uh, former double Klitschko victim, uh, he's making his return, and it's going to be on the Clarissa Shields versus Christina Hammer, Hammer on her card. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are familiar with Sam Peter. I mean, he wasn't an excellent fighter. Um, you know, his starching of Jeremy Williams, I believe, was, was you know, maybe the most prominent moment in his career, at least the one that sticks out in my mind. Uh, you know, obviously his, his, his three knockdowns of Vladimir Klitschko, uh, you know, that was very good too, but uh, maybe I'm mistaken. Again, it's, it's been a long time since I saw the fight. In fact, I haven't seen it since I saw it live. Uh, I believe two of those knockdowns were the result of fouls, but again, I, I, I could be wrong there and correct me if I am. Uh, but Sam Peter was, was mostly known for being a, a very big puncher. You know, he wasn't, particularly technical. Uh, he didn't have a lot of ring savvy. You know, he wasn't one of those James Tony types. Funny enough, a guy who he fought himself. But uh, he, again, he was a big puncher. He was a serviceable fighter, uh, you know, brief stint uh, near the top of the division. But of course, like just about anybody during that day, you, you just couldn't overcome the Klitschkos and especially Vitaly. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things with heavyweights uh, and just boxers in general. You know, it's when you take punches to the face for a living, you know, and deliver punches for the face for a living, it's it's hard to make a transition outside in the real world because, uh, you, you know, if you put that on a resume, how exactly does that convert into, you know, potential management experience or whatever it may be? So a lot of these guys have a hard time doing so and, in the process, they just continue to fight. And my guess is that Samuel Peter is probably on that same track. Uh, maybe he didn't have much in the way of job prospects um, elsewhere. So he's back fighting. And, and again, it's it's you get this far too often. You you've get these you get these guys who uh, you know they start telling themselves that they still got it and, and they can still knock guys off at the top and. Mm-hmm. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the time, then you know the nine point nine 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 percent or ninety nine point nine 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 percent of guys never make it that far, and Peter's going to be the same. You know, I, I I'm not a a big fan of today's heavyweight division, but uh, Peter, you know, Peter's was was never that level of fighter to me. But you also give him give him credit in the sense that he is one of the few people to ever legitimately hurt James Tony. And that's a that's a that's a tough thing to say, and you know something he can, I suppose, be proud of as well. But you know, I suppose it's a one of those things James Tony can be proud of too, because it took a uh, what a two hundred and forty five plus man, um, you know, other than Reggie Johnson, of course, to 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 actually you know get his noodles a little wobbly. But uh, yeah, we're gonna move on from there. Uh, we also had the. <clears throat> We also had um, Valdez uh, in a recent interview. He was saying that uh, he sees no reason why a Frampton fight can't be made. And, you know, with uh, Top Rank and Frank Warren recently shaking hands, uh, I'm on board with him. I mean, there was a, a, a period there where, you know, Frampton uh, with the Alphabet Soup organization stuff, he was he was the quote-unquote interim titleist. So he was next in line for uh, Valdez. And like Mike and I have talked about on the show, you know, the fact that Warren and Aram are working together is really, you know, because of all the brand uh, anymore, you know, with the the fractalization of of the sport, you're getting this stuff. And you, uh, you know, like John was saying on the Sunday show, you can only hope that these, these factions at least put the best of the best under their promotional banners 
in with one another. And this would be one of those fights. Um, Valdez is a skilled guy. Um, you know, he hasn't turned into the prospect. Uh, he didn't turn out to be as good as a number of people thought he might be. He, you know, he did show some good boxing ability early on. A lot of people thought that he could probably maintain that, uh, at the top level because of his amateur experience, but he's shown, uh, a pension for fighting and that will be to his detriment and already has been, uh, but he, he does have that extra gear, but it's the same thing with Frampton in the sense that you know, there's some versatility there. So I think stylistically, this is a very good fight. I'd really like to see it. I mean, I, ideally I would like to see Valdez fight, uh, you know, just the very best guys in a vision. And unfortunately Frampton isn't quite that anymore. Uh, to me, he looked a little long in the tooth against Warrington, um, or maybe it was just Warrington size and grit and determination. Uh, again, I could be wrong, but Frampton has kind of had these up and down performances in his career. So I, it just, uh, from my perspective, it's, it's tough to pinpoint exactly what was going on there, but, uh, no matter what it was, I mean, again, stylistically, this would be a very good fight and I, and I'd tune in. I know many others would as well. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to see where this is placed because, you know, if it's in Belfast, Ireland or something, I mean, you're going to sell a lot of tickets. Uh, you know, of course, with Bob Arum captaining the ship, you very well might get this in Las Vegas. Uh, either way, it's, it's one of those high quality matchups that should be made. We also have in the daily news, again, there is not a whole lot going on here, but, you know, things are starting to warm up along with the weather. Uh, you know, matches are starting to be made, you know, rumors floating about, people are starting to talk a bit more. Uh, you know, so it's, it's you know, we're, we're kind of exiting that dead period where we should actually start getting some, some decent fights here or, you know, something created in the future. Uh, but we also had the, the viewership numbers that were put out for Sergey Lipinets versus Lamont Peterson. And it only averaged about 290,000 views. And those numbers uh, were, uh, they're pretty bad. Um, you know, I thought they would be a bit better. Uh, I, you know, I did realize along with many of the American, uh, you know, sports fans is that, you know, it was going up against March Madness. Uh, you know, college basketball this time of year is is huge. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of college basketball myself. I used to be into it. I uh, used to be a Tar Heels fan, but you know, slowly I've just kind of transitioned into following one sport, uh, and of course that's that's boxing. Um, but yeah, it was going head to head with March Madness, and March Madness. If if I'm not mistaken, and again I could be wrong, please correct me if I am. Uh, that the viewership for March Madness so far has been something like uh, uh, the second or third biggest numbers that they've ever done. So. Uh, you, you know, you just didn't have a lot of people tuning in. And in fact, if anybody was on social media while this fight was happening, there were very few people talking about it. And I'm not exactly sure if that was, you know, because a lot of boxing fans also watch college basketball or if it's because, you know, it was just kind of a Sunday night and, uh, you know, just kind of took the night off. I mean, you know, sometimes you just want to kick back and relax. And anybody who's not familiar with American culture, you know, if, if any of the Brits are watching, I'm, I'm sure you, you get some of that over, you know, in Europe too. You know, Sundays are kind of viewed as the day of rest here. Uh, you know, of course, there's a religious connection there. But a lot of people just, you know, they just like to take it easy and not do a whole lot. So uh, my guess is that it was probably a combination of both. And... um yeah, I guess it's unfortunate because uh, a lot of people deserve to go back and watch that fight. Uh, you know, Lipinets and, and Peterson. I mean, say what you want to Peterson, right? I mean, he he's obviously over the hill, but he was still very, very good in that fight. I mean, you see a lot of the craft that guys who have been around in the game for a long time exhibit. Uh, you know, he stuck to his jab nicely. Uh, you know, he's always been a versatile guy, you know, who can fight a little bit and who can box a little bit. I mean, we saw what he did against Danny Garcia, where he's able to stick and move effectively. His reach is pretty good. Um, you know, and again, uh, we've seen him fight a little bit too. You know, you saw what he did against Timothy Bradley. Uh, as I noted not long ago, you know, that got him in trouble, you know, he ended up getting knocked down in that fight. 
but he's just a versatile guy. I mean, you saw him fight Amir Khan, uh, you know, a questionable decision there. But, of course, that, that's the way boxing works, right? He got a questionable decision over Amir Khan. I, I think most people thought that Khan had pulled that one out. But, again, it was very close. Uh, the rematch was squashed because of uh, Peterson's PED issues. But many people also saw Lamont Peterson beat Danny Garcia. And I, I think that's one thing worth noting about his career is that, you know, Danny Garcia, um, say, again, say what you will of, of his ability or, you know, his lack of pulling the trigger sometimes, he was the man at 140 pounds. I mean, he became the champion by beating Lucas Matisse, who was the number one or number two guy at the time. So, uh, and funny enough, I'm just going to branch off a little bit here because this has been kind of weighing on my mind as well. Um, how hard did Lucas Matisse hit? Uh, you know, it just, just in retrospect now, I mean, I, I always really liked Matisse. Uh, I liked, I liked watching, you know, he just had a fun style in my opinion. And, and he was one of the few legitimate one punch knockout guys, since, uh, you know, Randall Bailey left the division. Um, and I think his power, again, in retrospect, is looking better and better. I mean, you look at what he did to Lamont Peterson, he, he just bowled over the guy. And then you look at what he, an even older and, and bigger uh, Lamont Peterson, so, so, so out of his prime, Peterson, uh, was able to do against Errol Spence and, and Sergey Lipinets. And, and again, I'm not saying you know, winning rounds or anything. But what I'm saying is he was able to go uh, quite a while with Errol Spence. I mean, Spence was banging on him. You could tell that his shots were heavy. But, the, you know, in my opinion, they, they didn't have the the mustard that Lucas Matisse's did. I mean, the, the guy was a bona fide dyed-in-the-wool puncher. Uh, you know, anybody who's really been following this sport for a while remembers his knockout over Mike Dallas Jr., that was pretty, uh, I wouldn't say frightening, but it was was a, a conclusive shot, uh, a, a concussive shot, and, you know, just really got the job done within a round. <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I just, you know, I, I think that's worth noting. I mean, and it's always fun to see guys like that. I mean, I, I, you know, obviously Matisse showed that his, his heart wasn't as, as – uh, it wasn't as strong as, as, you know, a number of other guys, you know, like his contemporary Ruslan Provodnikov. But again, he just had heavy, heavy hands. Uh, I'd personally say that, you know, punch for punch, he hit harder than Marcos Maidana. Um, you know, and that's one of those things because all the divisions and, and alphabet trinkets and whatnot. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, you know, branching off a little bit further here onto uh, Twig. Um, but you know, that's a fight that I would have liked to have seen. I mean, Maidana versus Matisse, you know, two Argentina, ba Argentine bangers. Uh, I think that would have been fun. Uh, you know, if we're talking about pre Robert Garcia, Marcos Maidana, I think I'd actually favor, uh, Lucas Matisse there. I actually think Matisse was the better fighter though. Of course, uh, I know a lot of people would say that I'm wrong because of what, Matisse was, you know, Matisse didn't really make the cut at the top level, right? He was clearly outboxed by Danny Garcia. Marcos Maidana had a, a really good showing against Floyd Mayweather. So again, maybe I'm wrong, but of course it's a style thing, you know? So, you know, what, what Matisse did against Danny Garcia isn't really, it's not really relevant to what Marcos Maidana again, did against uh, Floyd Mayweather because again, there's different stylistically. I mean, you know, Marcos Maidana is not going to, uh, get on his toes and box Lucas Matisse. That would be one of those things where you have two guys coming forward. And if anything, you know, Matisse is more likely to, to assume the role of the boxer uh, than Maidana. And, and we see with uh, Maidana, especially before, you know, Robert Garcia got a hold of him. And, and again, I'm not attributing Robert Garcia as, as you know, completing this, this, you know, major transformation, but he did help him stay on the jab better. Uh, you know, he had a little more versatile, uh, versatility in his left hand, and you saw that in the Broner fight where, he, uh, you know, you want, you look at the first knockdown and he was jabbing consistently to the body. And so then he faints and then hits Broner up top, and uh, that's what puts him down. But, again, if we're talking about pre-Garcia when he's he's a bit raw and he's he's not, as, you know, quite so nuanced, um, you know, he just had some, some r rough – outings there. I mean, he had a tough one against, uh, Soto Karras. Um, you know, even having a tough one against Kotelnik. 
um, you know, not really an aggressor, but, you know, just kind of that, that upright European style. He, he would give you a lot of lateral movement too. And actually did quite a good job against Devon Alexander for those who remember, um, but no, I, I just think, you know, Maidana versus Matisse would have been a hell of a scrap. And I, I would love to have seen it. But uh, like so many other things in, in this sport, we just have to deal with, you know, just chalk it up to a miss. All right. So on this day, and this is one that I'm pretty excited about. It's not, uh, you know, some legendary scrap or anything. So, you know, it's not going to get a lot of people excited. But for me, you know, I... Um, you know, I haven't been a fan of boxing for a real long time. Um, you know, there are plenty of guys on, you know, I, who are friends with me on Facebook and uh, Twitter and, you know, where, wherever, who have been fans much, much longer than I have. I mean, you know, Mike, uh, the co-host, I mean, he's he's been a fan much longer. John Eidrenhofer has been a fan much longer. Actually, I've only been a real hardcore fan, I think, since 2004. And that was when I watched Lamar Murphy take on Damian Fuller on ESPN. It, might, it was either Tuesday night or Friday night fights. And, um, you, you know, a lot of people, you, they don't often ask me this question about, you know, how did you get into the sports? And a lot of times when, when you pull these these writers or these, you know, the boxers themselves and you're like, hey, who – who or what got you into the sports? And, and a lot of times, you know, you'll hear Mike Tyson. Uh, he's been a, a huge influence on many, many guys. And in fact, uh, 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 Amantis, the the prospect that I that I wrote about for for this month, uh, that's that's who his idol was. Um, I think Ivan Baranchek is the same way. Uh, pl- plenty of guys, you know, a lot of them got in, into it because of heavyweight boxing, but. For me, it was it was watching Damian Fuller outbox Lamar Murphy, and and uh, you know you got to be a real hardcore fan to to remember something like that. But you know Fuller was this this Detroit guy. I think he had a lot one loss coming in. Again, I could be wrong. I know he ended up getting stopped by Diego Corrales in I think three rounds. But Fuller was one of those those guys from Detroit. Had good skill, gave you good lateral movement. You know, real nice jab. Uh, you know, because he was starched by Corrales, he, he didn't have a great chin. He, he wasn't a great boxer, but he was definitely a, a good boxer. And Lamar Murphy was one of those volume punchers. You know, he, he overwhelmed you. He'd get inside, and, and he just he's, he's kind of like a poor man Meldrick Taylor, where you know he uh, and I do mean poor man's, but he, he would get close to you, and he, he would throw these combinations. His hands were pretty quick, but. You know, Fuller that night, again, it's it's all kind of fuzzy now because I don't think I've seen it since then. I'm not even sure if it's on YouTube. But Teddy Atlas did a great job of, of painting a picture for the the common fan about just what exactly Fuller was doing nicely. And it all just kind of clicked from there. You know, he again, he broke down the nuance, the the ins and outs of the game and showed why, you know, Fuller was, was winning the fight. And, and again, he ended up winning a decision there. Anyways, that's my introduction into the, the the sport. But around that time, uh, you know, I, I was a pretty big fan of the 140 pound division, and uh, a guy like Kasi Zhu, I was high on. I, I own his career DVD set, and I also really liked Ricky Hatton. And on this day, March 26, you had Ricky Hatton versus Tony Pep, and uh, you know, uh, for anybody who's been watching the sport at least as long as I have and as closely as I have, you know, Tony Pep was a serviceable guy. He was a good boxer, uh, you know, a veteran. You know, he ended up fighting a lot of interesting guys. I mean, he fought Floyd Mayweather. Um, you know, real lanky guy, it, 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 awfully tall for the division. I, I I can't remember how tall he was offhand, but I think he was about six foot, six one. You know, he, so he, he was he was very lanky for 140 pounds, and and you know, Hat went up against him, and and for the time, it seemed like a pretty good jump for Ricky. Of course, he was defending that. Uh, BSWBU trinket that they're trying to pass off as if it was, you know, some world title. Um, you know, and I, I actually think that was to Ricky Hatton's detriment. Uh, I think he just kind of hung on to that thing far too long and could have stepped it up years earlier. Um, but yeah, this was a, a nice step up for Ricky. Um, <clears throat> to me, it showcased uh, what I continue to say. And, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of people, I don't know, it's hard to say 
how how much they would agree with me. Um, you know, I know the Brits would probably be a bit warmer to this perception than you know maybe some of the Americans who really just started paying attention when he beat Jose Luis Castillo. You know, I've noticed that a lot of Americans didn't really pay attention to his stuff beforehand. You know, they had heard of him. Maybe they saw the Vince Phillips fight. You know, like when he started fighting on Showtime, that's when some of these more hardcore fans kind of picked it up but a lot of guys don't really pay attention until they fight somebody noteworthy and um jose luis castillo was the first real noteworthy noteworthy guy for americans and that was a fight that i saw live but again he was fighting on showtime beforehand you know fought uh, veterans like vince phillips and and uh, you know a number of other guys but you know in, in in britain he was he was awfully large and uh yeah he was just he was just one of my favorites at the time you know he was a real working class kind of guy uh you know great sense of humor just uh, you know again i'm i'm not british uh by nationality by blood yes um uh took a dna test so that you know that is something that i can lay claim to um you know it's just not a story that's been passed down you know from my my great grandmother and my mother you know it's a real bona fide thing with me uh, but yeah, Hatton was, you know, he was just this pale skin kind of working class kid with a great humor and, and just seemed as if he was kind of part of the pub culture. And again, if you're British and I'm wrong, you know, correct me. Uh, but he, he just seemed like one of those guys who, you know, you just hang out with, have a game of darts, you know, throw back a pint and, you know, enjoy yourself. And that had some appeal to me too, because, it, you know, I, I'm, Come, you know, my parents come from a working class background, so I could relate to that a little bit. So when he fought Tony Pep, I mean, my perception at the time was, you know, Hatton was going to beat him. Uh, I didn't really have any doubts about that. And that's kind of the way the fight played out. Ricky Hatton was, uh, he was just sharp in the fight. Uh, I think he knocked Pep down five or six times. And he was just, you know, you could see from the get go that Pep was trying to do all that he could to, to keep his elbows tucked in and avoid all the body shots, especially after he tasted a few of them. But Hatton just kept finding ways to dig him in, and he, he kept dropping him. I, I, I think every single knockdown, barring maybe one, and again, I could be wrong there. It's been a while since I saw the fight, and you know, I'm not box, rec- box wrecking this or anything. I'm just working on memory. <clears throat> Yeah, I think just about all of them, maybe all of them, were the result of, of body shots. Uh, there was one in particular that I, I thought was, was you know, very nice. I mean, he, he was, to me, Ricky Hatton is one of the greatest body punchers ever. Um, you know, you, you could, of course, say guys like, you know, Bob Fitzsimmons and Roberto Duran and Mike McCollum. And, you know, they, of course, they, they all earn, uh, they all deserve their their place among the, the pantheon. But to me, Hatton... Uh, what, what separated Hatton to me was just his his creativity. I, I've never seen anybody who had his angles. I mean, you go watch one of his early fights with Tommy Peacock. I mean, the stoppage there was just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you know, it, it just because of his size and his reach, he could pivot on a dime and get you right, you know, right in the pit of the stomach, around the sides. You know, uh, he could knock you down with a right hook, and that's actually what he ended up doing with Tony Pep. I mean, he he most most of the, the knockdowns were left hooks to the body. Uh, that was sort of his bread and butter. But he did score at least once, uh, one knockdown with a right hand to the body. And again, that to me, that just when I'm watching guys like you know, I was a big fan of Shane Mosley at the time too, and he was a very good body puncher coming up. Um, but th- this is sort of the way I evaluate things and. Again, as you know, as I, I say, if you disagree with me, you know, feel free to chime in. I'm pretty, uh, you know, I, I receive uh, criticism pretty well. At least I like to think so. But you know, Mosley was one of those guys, like so many others throughout history, <clears throat> who relied on a single punch or a single move. I mean, you look at a guy like Mickey Ward, and Ward was was fantastic. I mean, his his, but you know, his 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 move was he would tap you upstairs. And then bang you downstairs the liver. I mean, that that was his thing. And you know, every once in a while he did throw change ups in there where you know he'd hit you to the head, hit you to the body, then hit you back upstairs. But by and large, his move was 
you know, he'd tap you upstairs and, and then dig right into the left hook. And, and Mosley was kind of the same way where uh, he wouldn't tap you so much the head beforehand, but he, you know, because of his, his quote unquote power boxing style, he used to really dig in those left hooks. Uh, you know, he really got great leverage on him. And, and that's one thing that I really liked about him. But again, it was just one of those things where it was, it's just kind of predictable as a fan watching much of his career that, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of alternatives mixed in. But for me, Ricky Hatton, uh, he had more alternatives or change-ups. If you want to use a, a baseball analogy, he was he just had more pitches in his arsenal than, than many of these other guys. Um, he, again, he could throw uppercuts and he could, you know, dig a – a left hook into the body and knock you down, or he could, um, sorry, give me just a second here. Yeah, but but he could throw uppercuts and then dig the left hook. Again, he could pivot, hit you in the, you know, the pit of the stomach. I mean, he just, he was just so versatile in everything that he did in regards to body punching. And he was, he was just dedicated there. Uh, He just wasn't as good to the head as he was to the body. And, you know, even against top level opposition, of course, a guy like, uh, you know, Manny Pacquiao or, you know, Floyd Mayweather, he wasn't able to really, uh, he wasn't really able to showcase his prowess there. Of course, you know, Pacquiao just he didn't really he wasn't all that competitive in that fight and uh, you know I'm not going to complain too much about the Mayweather performance though I think you know Joe Cortez was a little quick in breaking them up you know yeah I mean I understood Hatton's frustration where he said hey you know it's hard enough to get close to that guy as is and then when I got there you're breaking us up it's just again I'm not going to complain too much and and act like Ricky Hatton would have won the fight because I do think Floyd would have ended up you you know make you know, earning the decision. But you look at the way Joe Cortez refereed the Jose Luis Castillo fight, and then you look at the way he refereed the Mayweather fight. To me, it's just it's just two different styles. And I, I thought Hatton early on did a really good job of closing the distance. Uh, and he was, he was you know, trying to pin Mayweather to the ropes and, and unleash his shots. But he just never really got the chance there. But again, to me, he's just one of the best body punchers I've ever seen. And Pep was just one of those showcase fights where, you know, I would point to if somebody was like, hey, well, you know, if if he's so good, give me an example. And I think the Pep fight is one of the best examples of that. Uh, There was one particular knockdown where uh, I think they were being broken up and Hatton landed uh, kind of a soft left hook to the head, but he was kind of, you know, this was as they were kind of breaking up. And, you know, Pep uh, predictably put his left hand up and then Hatton, you know, dug right in with a left hook and dropped him. And, you know, from then on out, you could just see Pep's legs getting, you know, heavier and heavier. And uh, Hatton ended up scoring the stoppage. And again, to me, it was a good win. Uh, I also thought it was an indicator that Hatton should have stepped up, uh, you know, years before he actually did. Um, But it is what it is. It's all set in stone and you can't rewrite history. Um, But that's that's the on the day. And. Uh, That's all I've got for this edition. It's a little bit longer than last night's. And uh, uh, if you listen to the show, again, I want want to thank you, everybody who who shares it, who listens, gives me feedback. I mean, I I, I genuinely appreciate it. And I'm receptive to feedback as well. I mean, if there's a segment you would like to see added, uh, analysis on on something else, if you would like to do a QA and a with you and me or, you know, others, you guys want to send in questions. I'm cool with that too. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I try to be transparent about this whole thing and, and, you know, I, I try to be as objective as I can. Um, you know, and, and hopefully I'm doing my job. So, uh, you know, for, for tonight's show, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. But again, we're brought to you by my Uh, it's a betting platform, um, you know, you can click on the banner on the gruelingtruth.net, the homepage, follow it, and, and you know, they'll, they'll give you some cash back if you sign up. If you go directly to the website, you can use the code TGT50. Again, you'll get a, a, some nice little money back because of that as well. Um, and we're also brought to you by the Retired Boxing, bo- uh, sorry, Boxers Foundation with Alex Ramos. 
real nice guy, you know, doing his best for guys, you know, because again, this is, this is a tough sport and a lot of guys don't have going back to the Sam Peter thing. A lot of these guys don't have good financial opportunities after their careers up. Uh, you know, even guys who are world-class operators and fought tons and tons of big fights, a lot of them are still doing pretty poorly. Um, so yeah, just, just go there and, and help out all that you can. And I'm, I'm just going to thank you guys once more. And you can listen to this podcast on, on Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, uh, you know, iTunes, YouTube, a- anywhere you find podcasts. You can find uh, Inside Boxing Daily or any of our other shows. So once again, I appreciate it and have a good night.